Uh, so tonight, today we have uh, Catherine McKinley from Google, and we're going to start off with a couple logistics before we uh, move right into her talk. Logistics, first of all, if at any time you don't have to wait to ask questions till the end, there is a question and answer box here, Q&A box. And if you type in a question as we're going, we'll either relay the question to the speaker or we'll uh, go ahead and answer it for you online as the talk is going on. We also have some fun going on during the talk and that is in the, in the form of polls. So this makes it a little more interactive and we will start with uh, two polls here just to give you some idea of how this works. So the first poll uh, you could go ahead and answer is what day of the week is best for you to attend a future virtual undergrad town hall webinar? So we're trying to uh, get to as many people as possible and we want to make it um, possible both by the day and by the time of day. So please uh, hit any of those days that are best for you and we will take this into account as we're going forward. All you have to do is click and then hit the submit button at the bottom. And we'll wait a couple seconds to see what the results of that are and then move on. It looks like Thursdays are actually the best, so that's perfect for this. Uh, the next poll is uh, what time of the day? So the these webinars work in that we have about an hour first of presentation, and that's going to be divided up into about a 30, 30 minutes of technical research, and then we also have a mentoring topic for the day, which today is all about your village, creating your village. Uh, and then we follow that with an online chat, um, and so we're trying to figure out what hour and a half time slots are best for you. And we do have to consider the fact that we have people in different time zones. So go ahead and pick what's most convenient for you and hit the submit button. And we will use this as data going forward. So while you're doing that, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our speaker. Today we have Catherine McKinley from, and she's a senior research scientist at Google. She was previously a researcher at Microsoft and also uh, an endowed professor at University of Texas at Austin. Her research is, uh, spans uh, the field of programming languages, compilers, runtime systems, architecture, performance, and also energy, which is more of her current uh, focus. So I am, she's also very involved in service, both for broadening participation in computing and in her research community. So I'm going to take it over to Catherine at this point and let her begin her research talk on measuring and optimizing tail latency. Go ahead, Catherine. Thank, thank you, Laura. My quick trivia fact is Lori was my uh, professor when I was a PhD and undergraduate student at Rice, and so it's great to be here with her and having her sponsor this talk. Today, I'm gonna to talk about some work that I did with colleagues at uh, Australian National University and at uh, Microsoft when I was there. And, and I'm going to start with a poll. So I'm gonna ask you, when you're waiting for web results, when you type your query into Google search or when you go to a new web page, how long do you wait for the web results before abandoning the website? So less than a second, a second, 10 seconds, a minute, it depends. And then do you ever go back to that website? And while you're filling out that, I'm gonna tell you just a little bit more about myself. Except it won't let me move forward. I, as I work for Google right now, I've done research in garbage collection, automatic memory management, in servers and tail latency, which I'm gonna talk about to you today, and also on uh, energy efficiency, both in the data center, but also on, uh, 
on mobile devices where it's even more important. And I've had a couple mentors in my life. I'll talk about them a little bit, but Don Johnson helped me um, discover I like doing research with a research as an undergrad experience. So if you have the opportunity to work with a professor at your university or go apply to the distributed uh, Drew program, distributed undergraduate research activities, I highly recommend it. It changed my life. And then the middle person there is my advisor, Ken Kennedy. And uh, the other person there is um, Dave, Dave Stemple, who is my first department chair. Was an, I was an assistant professor. And he really helped me combine family and, uh, and this job so that I had enough time uh, and leaves when I had my children. And there's when they're adorable and cute. And now they're, um, they're teenagers and, or 23-year-olds. And so there's more angst there. But they're still great. And one of the highlights of my career, it, having a research career, you get asked to do a bunch of different things in terms of uh, uh, interacting with government, the general public, and people in your research area. And one of the things I got to do was talk about the interactions and the flow of people between research institutions and, uh, and, and companies like Google and Microsoft. And so that was super fun. And my parents came and watched me give testimony. And I'm here, so I must be kind of successful, get to talk to you. But uh, I want to notice that I've had a lot of, or note that I've had lots of failures in my career. And in when I was an undergrad, I had to repeat a semester because I took too much on one semester. And then a couple years later, as a graduate student, I failed my uh, qualifying exams and I was getting ready to leave graduate school and, and someone encouraged me to stay. And all these things, um, even though they weren't fun at the time, I really learned a lot about uh, managing my time. Uh, what did I really want to do? I wanted to stay in graduate school, so I did things like get rid of the TV and move it to the closet, but that wasn't far enough, so I took it to my in-laws so I could pass my exams. And, and the result is that when you fail, you can can give up and do something else. Maybe that's the answer sometimes, but oftentimes it's to examine yourself and see what you can do to change so that you can meet your goals. And so I, want, I, I like to share that it's not all roses. Okay, so I can't, because I'm, my screen is occupied, what did the poll say about, uh, Lori, what did the poll say about how long people are willing to wait for their results? or anyone who can speak. Catherine, you'll just need to click on the slides itself and then you'll be able to use your arrow keys again. Okay, so uh, I, uh, I'm, when you, so I'm gonna start the technical part of my talk now. So when you search, you like to get results quickly. And what's behind that is the network and a whole bunch of servers that give you a response. And if you don't get a response quickly, you are very unhappy as a user and you stop using services. So Google published some results that even a 400 millisecond delay, which is less than half a second, decreased searches per user by, by um, uh, a half a percent. And that Bing published some another search engine that I used to work on, that two-second slowdown reduced revenue per user by 4.3%. And so these are huge numbers if you stop using interactive services. But, so that has to be the top pr priority by the providers. But behind that is this giant data set. So let's step back and think about what it costs to build one of these data centers and run it. So some quick facts is just to be even a little small data center that, uh, that, that, that one company might build for themselves or would be a component in a huge set of data centers like Google has is at least $500,000. That's like even your starting cost. But then to run it, you have to pay for energy and the land and everything else. 
And there were over 3 million data centers in the U.S. in 2016, and there are even more now. And that was represents 1.5 trillion uh, capital investments. And if you're interested in this, there's an inter the, this report by Shihabi et al. At, uh, from Lawrence Berkeley takes uh, information that the government requires uh, about when you build these things and synthesizes a bunch of it, and that's where this information came from. And so there, then to put, to run these is $3 trillion of kilowatt dollars per year of energy, and that's just in the U.S., not counting the rest of the world. So if you just do 1% less work, you save $30 million, all right? And if you do 1% less work, you might not even have to build some data center, and that, that saves companies even a lot more. So the companies are really motivated by making this efficient. They have to make it their top priority or they won't make any money. But they have to balance that with tail latency because if the users aren't happy, then they have no service to run and they can't make any money either. All right, so we want to have both. So this talk is about a little bit how to have both. So just to review how the client server architecture works is you put in a query uh, in your phone or other device. It goes out on the, the network and it goes to an aggregator or, or a coordinator manager service. And depending on what you ask for, it might have cached the results already. And so then it could return something very quickly to you. But if you have a new query or something that hasn't been asked before or just a little different so it's not cached right away, then it spreads out the request to a bunch of workers. And you can see I've drawn the workers as having a various amount of work that they're doing and so various amount of queuing delay because they maybe they're already doing too much work or, uh, or other things going on that might interfere with your request. And then all the workers send back the response and, and the aggregator prior, does a little bit more work on that, prioritizing the best answers from the individual workers and finally sends, sends it back to the client. So that's the basic architecture. And then because these things are deployed and run for a very long time, they have this cumulative histogram of how much time different requests take. And so this is, I'm going to give results from Lucene, which is an open source a search engine that, uh, for example, Disney uses to service their website and a bunch of other big companies use. So, it, so you can look inside it and modify it. So I've worked with academics on this. And so we prove things here. And then some of the things I'll talk about were implemented in Bing. And I'm hoping that some of them will be implemented in Google Search soon. So this graph shows the percent of requests on the y-axis and on the x-axis, it shows the latency of those requests. And so in the, this is about 2,000 requests for Lucene, and you see that most requests are short, but a few requests are long. So this cumulative histogram of how long requests take, it, that, that characteristic is a highly optimized system engineer problem, and it's very typical for services uh, that like Facebook or, or, uh, or search use. All right, so there's a couple underlying patterns. They're bursty and diurnal, so you need to be able to provision and add and delete servers to handle those bursty requests. And then this, but this, if you look at requests over a day or a week or even a month, this cumulative distribution function and these underlying uh, uh, distribution of requests as percentages of all requests doesn't change very much. So you can use that to optimize your system, all right? And then the slowest server, these at the end uh, that take more, um, milliseconds than the other, microseconds than the other, they dicta dictate the slowest response and thus they dictate the responsiveness you see as an end user. 
And usually there's an order of magnitude difference between the average, in this case, which is about five or 10, and the tail, which is about 100. And that's very typical for these kinds of services. All right, so if we need to optimize the tail in order to bring it down so it's more responsive, we need to understand what's in it. All right, so we built a tool to help do that. And in the past, the way you had to do that was the way you actually debug today in your, in your uh, classes, which is add print statements. And these print statements in the past had to have what method you were in and a timer. And so then you could figure out and optimize your system. But it had to be very application specific. It was very brutal and very uh, time consuming and tedious to get it right. So we invented a new cycle level online profiling tool that you can deploy with any service and will give you really good information every time. So you have to have the right things in your toolkit in order to understand these things. And our insight was that the hardware and the software are generating signals. And these signals are, uh, are for example, the hardware performance counters or a memory location. And so those can tell you what method you're executing in or how many instructions per cycle you're executing. So we built, so the way this tool works is you have a separate thread that reads out the hardware performance counters or the memory locations and tells you stuff about your program, all right? And so you can take the, the instructions per cycle on the core and on a hyper thread and then you can cancel out the stuff that you're actually generating because you have the observer effect of this little thread running along on the core with the thing you care about. So you have to be very careful on, uh, on limiting the observer effect. And we have some details in the paper if you're interested. And then, we, then we're able to figure out what's going on. So I'm not gonna go into more detail on this tool. I could give a whole talk on that, but uh, let, but I'm going to show you some of the results of using this tool. Okay, so now we're going to take what those those 200 requests that are the very longest requests, and we're going to run this tool that I just told you about that's called Shim on those requests, and then we're going to divide up what's happening in those requests in uh, in a histogram as well. So this is these 200 longest requests. And I've categorized four kinds of things that are going on. You're actually doing the work of the search request, which is uh, looking up the index and then running some ranking functions on it. That's the green. And so you can see there's some green over there in the longest request. That means for this request, you just had to do more work on this server for some reason. And then we have the red, which is queuing at the worker. And that means that you had a burst of requests, and unfortunately, you can't handle them all on the CPU with the number of CPUs you have. And then orange is idle, and that's just your system is sucking for a random reason, and you need to figure out what that is and minimize it. So the operating system can just deprioritize your task or do something else. So, so that, 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 that can happen too. And then the blue is the network controller, because if you don't get the request immediately to the service, you can't do the work. And so, so all these things, seeing all these things, you have to optimize them with different strategies. And the, this is the red, and that comes from being overloaded. The blue comes from network imperfections and sometimes overload. The idle, as I already pointed out, comes from OS imperfections. And then the CPU work is long requests. So you can think of network imperfections and OS imperfections as noise. You can optimize your system to get them down as low as possible, but you can't get rid of all of them because these are complicated non-deterministic systems, but you can minimize them based on this methodology. But CPU work and queuing at the worker when you have too many things to do, those are not noise and those are things that you have to have different techniques to optimize. And those are mostly what I'm gonna talk about today. And though you can see they're an important component in the table. So, so 
So we have three basic uh, strategies, sources of overhead, and three different strategies to work on them. So noise, you have to deal with the fact that systems aren't perfect, and sometimes things will go wrong and will crash, et cetera. So you have to do something about that. Queuing, you need to have uh, uh, overloading the, the system can be a problem. All right, I'm, get, I'm running over here, so I'm going to choose to do one part of the talk in, well, and then I'll go over the second part very quickly, all right? So I'm going to talk about, uh, about dealing with noise first, and then I'll talk a little bit about dealing with work in terms of the long request. But your system should tolerate or have strategies to deal with these all these latencies. And we're going to use that cumulative distribution function I told you offline to, to design optimization techniques. And we're going to notice that as the query's running, regardless of what made it a long request, if it was noise queuing or work, you know it's a long request because it executes more than five microseconds. When something goes over five microseconds, it's over the average, so it becomes more probable that it's a really long request the longer it executes. So you can deal with it, you, so you don't have to predict which one's going to be a long request. You can deal with it as it uh, uh, reveals itself. All right. So that's the major insight that we're going to use at this point. All right. So we're going to try, and one of the basic techniques is to replicate and reissue a query in order to say if it's noise, then this server might be experiencing some noise, but this other server that can also handle this request may not be. So, so then by duplicating, you reduce the chance that your inner that your the request is interfered with due to noise. Okay? So then should you duplicate all requests? Well, that's super expensive. So that doesn't meet our target of being efficient. All right. So, but the commute, as I told you, this cumulative distribution function is going to help us. So it it tells you both the cost and the potential. So if we have one time at which we issue the um, the duplicate request, for example, if we issue it at 40 microseconds, then uh, then then we'll reissue about 10% of requests, because about 10% of requests are longer than 40 microseconds, okay? So then you can push that out and reissue more, but you can't push it too far out, because if the long request is due to noise, you have to have enough time to do the work in a less noisy system. So that says each request might need a different time. So there was some work by my colleagues at uh, Microsoft on uh, what, what, when is the best time? Can you use some uh, uh, queuing theory and some this cumulative distribution function to figure out better times? All right. So if we push to the left, we don't want to reissue more, but what we can do is we can reissue on the same budget with some probability, and that captures not all the long requests, but many of the long requests, and it especially captures the ones that get noise, all right? It doesn't capture the ones that just do too much work because you can't, you can't get them, you can't improve their time by just reissuing them. And so that, uh, that's better than choosing one earlier reissue time, so you get optimal results with it. And I'm going to skip over the results so I can talk about the other thing. And so let's think about if this is work in that tail. All right? So we're going to, I'm going to describe briefly with my last five minutes on the technical portion here. I'm going to uh, briefly describe a way to introduce a judicious amount of parallelism. Away. Ah, <laughs> sorry. I should have shut off my mail, but it has my instructions on how to rejoin if I need to rejoin. So I didn't do that. All right. So uh, 
And then we had two other approaches that I'm not going to talk about today. So why is Perelson a good idea? Well, we have all these multi-core machines. But historically, what we've used these machines for is uh, to do throughput. So to do different requests in uh, on the same on those parallel processors instead of the same request broken up into parts. And why is that? It's because if you're only optimizing for throughput and average performance, then any overheads from parallelism, which there are always are some uh, to break these things up and put them back together, those decrease your average response time for those fastest requests. And so people haven't used this parallelism in these throughput oriented systems. And so, but when you're optimizing for tail latency, then sacrificing a little bit of the average performance in order to rein in the tail is actually a lot better. And it doesn't require only optimizing for throughput. And so that was our basic insight. So then if you're going to do parallelism, how are you going to do it? Well, you could, as I've just shown in this little animation, every request that comes in, you could parallelize it with a fixed degree. And that might be okay, but we saw that a bunch of those requests were short. So for short requests, it's not helping their response time, and it's introducing some overhead. So how can we parallelize just the long request, all right? So I've already said most of this. And so here, we're going to incrementally add parallelism to these long requests, these tail requests. And we're going to do it based both on the progress of the request and the load on the system. And I'm going to show you a little uh, few results to show you why that's uh, a good idea. All right, so in this diagram, I have Lucene request per second on the, the x-axis, and I have tail latency, which is the 99 percentile latency of, of requests in this system. And here's where we start, where each request is its own sequential request, and we only get uh, throughput based on adding more requests that are independent. And then the blue bar, this first bar, is parallelize the request as soon as they get there and parallelize them four-way, which turns out to be a good, good point for this system. And you can see this really works well at lower requests per second. But at this higher request per second, that par those overheads mean that the system doesn't uh, get good enough throughput. And so we've kind of made a false trade-off here in not get, although the tail is on average lower, it does, we want to push out so we also get more requests per second. So if we wait a fixed interval and introduce the parallelism, we get to push this curve out without, with good tail latency at the low, at the low request per second. And if we wait a little longer, we do even better. But if we wait too long, we don't get, we don't bring the tail down very much, although we do get uh, an increase in requests per second. So our dynamic approach, which uh, says, based on what load you have on your entire system, introduces the parallelism at, like, so at high load, it introduces parallelism at 500 microseconds. At low load, it introduces it at, uh, it introduces it sooner. And that gives us the best of both worlds. And now I'm just going to show you the green and the black line. And I'm going to say, OK, that gave us the tail. But we could also put, use this result not just to uh, decrease the tail latency. We could buy fewer servers, because now each server can uh, handle more requests per second. And this is uh, depending on the trade-offs you're making in your overall data center design. This can also be a good idea. All right, so I showed you about that and how we can improve efficiency and tail latency. And, uh, and now we're going to go, uh, and, and, and I also talked about, just to pull it all together, a little bit on how you do uh, repeated 
queries in order to reduce the tail latency due to noise, and so your system needs to manage all these things together. And uh, one thing that you might have learned about throughput in your undergraduate classes is, uh, is to optimize the average case, but in interactive services where you have to consider the tail is just as important as the average case, that that, in, that, that optimization strategy isn't quite what you want. And then one of the things that we're seeing in data centers today is a lot more heterogeneity in the hardware. And so that's an interesting open problem that I, that I also enjoy working on. All right, does anyone have any questions about this part of the talk? So we have a couple questions. Uh, one question is, how do you evaluate this research? So how do you, what kinds of, how, where do you get like your workloads or your input requests? So, so in or, so when I was working at Microsoft on this work, I, uh, they didn't want to publish the Bing, uh, the Bing search times and the results that we got from doing this adaptive parallelism inside the Bing search engine. And so what we did was use this open source version and we sh showed in one of the papers that we wrote on this system that it approximates the same kind of problems that we see in Bing. And so then we can use this open source software and we can do both experiments on a single server and we can do experiments that have that uh, distributed server architecture that I talked about. And so we use the tools to measure the difference in in uh, average and tail latency by instrumenting the system or using uh, the tool I talked about, SHIP. Okay. So you're using, you're creating some tools and you're also using some open source uh, tools and then trying to transfer that to the commercial tools. That's right. And we also, as a, as a industrial researcher inside now Google, but inside uh, Microsoft at the time, both companies don't want to publish data, but they will publish relative data. So we publish relative data, or they'll publish some old data that might not be exactly true now, but at least demonstrates the problem. So how do you get your workloads to represent reality? Well, so we have reality. At Google, I have access to... Uh, to uh, extensive performance data on all our services. And so we figure out what the problems are by looking at that. And then we publish some subset of that that both show our motivation and, uh, and our relative results. Instead of like the exact microsecond number, we publish, oh, we got better by a factor of two or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Uh, the other question, so I think we'll just do two questions so that we can move on to the mentoring. The other question is, what kind of background uh, in particular uh, students are usually interested in? What kind of courses would they have to take to do this kind of research? Okay, so, so uh, I feel like the computer science degree lacks a statistics class in general, and having a good statistics class helps you understand if, uh, if your performance results are meaningful. And then in the particular uh, research I'm talking about today, the operating systems class uh, that includes uh, networking and, uh, and uh, parallel processing, how to manage uh, parallel systems, are the basic information you need to get, start, get started in this line of research. Okay, great. So why don't we move on to the mentoring, and if there's more questions people have, they can start them on the online chat after we're done with the mentoring section. Great. Okay. So I'm going to now spend a few minutes uh, talking about how you make professional and keep professional relationships over your career, and you'd be surprised how that some professor uh, that you're uh, working with now, you could know that person your whole career. And a great example was Lori Pollock <laughs> for me, who I met when I was an undergraduate at Rice, and then I became a graduate student at Rice, 
and still we're uh, interacting on the Computer Research Association uh, Committee on the Status of Women, even though we haven't been at the same institution in 25 years. And so you, uh, as an academic, uh, active in the research community, who uh, your community is uh, other academics with similar research interests or similar service interests in the case of uh, both working on the, the CRAW board together. And so as an undergraduate, however, you have an academic village right now, and that consists of your peer students are part of your academic village. And then you have the students senior to you, who you might get advice from, and you have the students who are junior to you, who you might help and mentor and pay it forward by teaching them lessons that you had to learn the hard way. And so they don't have to, like uh, go taking a course from the professor who, who just really does the best job, for example, or how the trick to doing the, getting all this, these uh, lab assignments done on time, starting early, et cetera. And then you have uh, people you don't know quite as well for example, the teaching assistants in your class and your PhD students who may or may not be teaching assistants but are working for the professor you're taking a class from, and then the faculty who you take classes from. And so all these people you have um, uh, the opportunity to get to know them and to have them help you and have you help them. So, at, and that's kind of your your academic professional village right now. So for me, as a senior researcher at Google, I have uh, uh, my, my academic and professional village is basically anybody who does research in any career stage on any topic that I'm interested in. And of course, I don't know all these people, but there are lots of them that I do know. And it doesn't matter what stage of their career they're in, they could be undergraduates, PhD students, postdocs, faculty, industrial researchers. They all, uh, if they're interested in the same topic and producing good results on it, I want, I want to read their papers. I want to know what they're doing. Uh, when they get their PhD, I might want to help hire them at Google. I recently helped hire a couple fabulous young PhD students. So, so it's not just looking up as a student trying to get influence. If you're a senior person, you need to be looking down and saying, who are the up or coming people that I would like to be on the same team with or at least follow their work? And in industry, as an industrial researcher, I, uh, I have like all the software engineers who I work with in the cloud team because I'm the way Google does it is you're embedded in uh, in a product team and I'm embedded in the cloud team. And so I have a manager. So of course my manager, I need that person to be my supporter, mentor, as well as um, advocate. And then there are people my manager reports to. And then there are administrators who help get everything done and schedule people's calendars. And if you're not nice to them, if you can't be nice to them because it's the right thing to do, be nice to them because you can't get on anyone's calendar without the admin letting you. And then not only do you need to know people in your management chain, both above and below you, you need to know people in other management chains who you might interact with so that you can find the right person to help solve cross-team problems. So those are, that's an example of my network. And so I want to talk a little bit, uh, I talked a little bit at the very beginning about faculty mentors, but I want to encourage you to find at least one professor whose course you really liked or you read about their research on their webpage and you found it super interesting to try to develop a closer personal relationship with. And how do you do that? Well, ask questions in class so they remember who you are and then go to their office hours and talk to them about the homework or talk to them about their research because you read one of their research papers or ask them more detailed questions on advanced topics. Ask them like, I'm really interested in this part of the course. Or in my case, I asked Don Johnson, I wanted to stay in Houston the summer of my junior year. 
And uh, at that point in my life, I had no intention of going to grad school. And I just wanted a summer job in Houston because I didn't want to go home and live with my parents again in Virginia. And my boyfriend was going to be staying there in the summer. And so I asked him, can I have a job? And he said, yes. And why did I get that job? Not because I was the best student in his class. I got that job because I asked first. So asking is important. And, what, and that changed the course of my life and my career because that summer I wrote a local area network simulator in my undergraduate research project and I realized the professors didn't know all the answers. That they thought the bottleneck was going to be the network and this is one of the first local area networks and it was still the disk. And so they poured over my code and they couldn't believe it was true. And I'm like, ooh, this is fun. This is so much more motivating than homework. All right, <laughs> and so so that's the kind of relationship I suggest you get started with at with some professor at your university who who you really like and enjoy working with at some at some level. So now uh, do you, I'm going to ask this poll question. Do you have an academic mentor already? that uh, someone you want to talk to about your career, what classes you should be taking, maybe doing a research project, or if you have more than one, what I like, one was enough for me, but you could have more than one slide. And now I'm going to give you some practical advice about building a bigger village than just your, your uh, that's great to see that that all of you have at least one mentor and a few of you have an action item from this talk and many of you have several academic mentors. I suggest getting more than one. So all the yeses, try to move to a C. So how do you build your village? Well, you need to do what we call networking, okay? And networking is building and sustaining professional relationships and you need a space there between professional and relationships but they're closer together. And that, and for a researcher, it's participating at being a member of an academic research community, which goes beyond your university. But as an undergrad, it means uh, participating in this academic community that is your, your uh, department and your university. And that, that why do you want to do this? Well, you want to find people you like and who encourage you and help you with your career and you learn from and you want to build a relationship so it's not just like meeting the maximal number of people that's not really the point of networking the point of networking is to meet enough people that you find some who you really enjoy being with and you learn from and uh, and and if you're a peer the older or the mentor in the relationship that you give, 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 give and get good advice. So networking is not using people and it's not a substitute for doing a good job in your class or whatever, but it enhances good work and, uh, and good re relationships help you find opportunities. Okay, but what, what am I gonna talk to these people about? I'm horrible at small talk. You already have one thing in common with everybody in this academic network. You go to the same university in your, in your major. You have computer science or, or electrical engineering or whatever your major is. You have that in common. And networking is not genetic. Like you have to practice. It's a research. It's a professional skill. And so you want to introduce yourself to people. You want to learn about them and what they're doing. You want to go places beyond your university, especially if you're considering uh, going to grad school and meet people from other institutions. And then ways to make these things happen are volunteering. And then once you've met some of these people, you need to sustain your relationship with them, which means you need to take proactive steps in order to see them again, to communicate with them through social media or through uh, better for me personally, to send a personal email. And then, and then who do you choose to network? So first of all, you don't know who you'll like initially, but if you like and enjoy somebody, that's a good signal that you should continue networking with them and building a relationship. And then 
you want people senior to you who can show you the way, people at different career stages so you can see all the possible different paths and anticipate it, and your peers, because your peers are going through the same thing that you are right now. And so, of course, they're a hugely valuable source of strategies for getting the homework done, for applying to graduate school, because they're doing these things right now. Or someone who, who did these things last year, one year ahead of you, because it's fresh in their mind what they did right and what they did wrong, and they have good experiences. So here are three uh, people who have been peer mentors throughout my career. So Mary Hall I met in graduate school. And she uh, was an undergrad. We were at, the, at Rice together, and we both were Rice undergrads, and then we were grad students, and then we both had, fam like we tr had families at the same time trying to combine career. And on uh, over this weekend, I was in uh, New Orleans with Mary, just having fun, having a girls weekend, which is like the third time we've done that with a bunch of friends. And so, what do I talk to Mary about? Like, uh, if some, I'm having some problem with a professional relationship. If I'm trying to, how do you do all this uh, family stuff and career? What, what shortcuts are you taking? What do you do? How do you organize the kids' summer? What's your philosophy on, should they just do sports in the summer? Should they do academics, et cetera? You have someone going through the same thing at the same time. And Mary and I have been at different institutions, so it's always safe to talk to Mary and give her details because nothing's ever going to come back to me in a bad way in terms of if I'm like giving the dirt on some colleagues that I'm having trouble with. She is completely an impartial third party to that. So that's really good to have a like, oh, you, I think you're interpreting that behavior more poorly than you need to, or, ooh, I would tell my department chair about that and give yourself some protection, or whatever's going on, the good and the bad. And then Doug Berger is a researcher who's younger than me, and I was started out at the University of Massachusetts where we interviewed Doug, and I tried to get him to come be a professor because I thought he'd done really good work in architecture. I worked mostly in programming languages. I wanted to work more closely with architects. And he said no and went to the University of Texas, but then he, he uh, helped convince me that I wanted to go to the University of Texas and be a professor there. And then when I arrived, we spent about uh, a decade collaborating on a big project. And, and then he went off to Microsoft Research, and he is one of the reasons I also joined Microsoft Research. And so... So even though he was younger than me, he was a, a colleague, close professional colleague. We published a bunch of work together. We did joint grants. But then when he moved, he also convinced me that that might be a good career move. So, so you never know. And then Margaret Martinosi was a graduate student at, uh, at Stanford who I met when I was graduating. And she also works in computer architecture. And we've had service in common, and we've had architecture, I kind of not, even though it's not my main research area, it's part of it. So she, uh, she so, so there's a bunch of stuff, uh, but while I'm kind of running a little short on time, so I won't detail all the ways in which Margaret has helped me, but I will note that she's the Computer Science Research Association Committee on the Status of Women. She's the chair right now, and I'm the former co-chair, so we've worked together on a lot of service together, too. So do you have a peer mentor who you go to and talk to? Do you have many or, uh, or no peer mentors? So when something happens, who do you go to to get advice? So Catherine, while they're answering that poll, I have a question for you. Okay. What was your biggest concern about going to graduate school when you finally decided to go? I guess I uh, I I was concerned about funding actually that I would I needed to make some money to go to graduate school and I didn't quite realize that almost everybody in graduate school uh 
in computer science is completely funded their entire uh, time that they're in grad school. And even though it's not a ton of money, it's not what you could make in industry as a computer scientist. It, since you're used to making nothing as an undergrad, you're, uh, it's a lot more than nothing. And, uh, and, and, it, and so I was fully supported all the way through grad school. And so your department has money. The National Science Foundation funds a lot of computer science research. DOE funds a lot of computer science research. So essentially, at not every single graduate student, but the vast majority in computer science have a stipend or a teaching assistant their entire time that they're in grad school that uh, pays your living expenses. Mm -hmm. And I am super happy to see the poll here that says 50% um, of you have at least one mentor, 12% don't have a peer mentor, and 31% have very many. So I wanna move the 62% of you that only have one or don't have one, think about who you uh, think about developing a relationship with someone you enjoy talking to, to who takes the same classes, who has uh, maybe has a view on some of this stuff, uh, at, or is it older or uh, slightly younger, and so that you can be a mentor to them, or if they're slightly older, that they can have good advice for your next stages like some successful student who's one year ahead of you, like you could get tips on studying or, or ask your questions to. All right, anything else, Lori? I think you have one more slide and then we'll uh, wrap this up and move on to the online chat. Okay, so it's super important to have a village because as you move through your career stages, now, let's say you want to go to graduate school. To go to graduate school, you need letters of recommendation. If you do a research experience with an undergraduate, uh, an undergraduate research experience, then, then uh, that shows that you know what research is and how to do it. And the person who was your supervisor, either at your home institution, or if you do one of these distributed research experiences, then, uh, then you'll have someone who's worked closely with you and they'll be able to write a very uh, convincing letter that you know what you're doing in terms of applying to research uh, for graduate school. And that person, uh, so these letters of recommendation to go to grad school, require, they don't require, but it certainly helps. I say yes if I've actually worked with a student, I'll write a letter. Or, uh, but if I have just had this person in class, I don't remember their name because they've never spoken to me uh, outside of that, how can I write you a good letter? So that's super important to develop these closer relationships with faculty members if you want to go to grad school. And then, uh, and then they can help you solve problems, give you advice. Um, given your record, I would apply to here or given uh, your research interests, these are the best schools for those research interests. So those are good places to apply. And they'll encourage you, and they'll choose you for important roles. For example, if you've talked to them, and uh, every semester at UT, we would send around an email, okay, who do you think we should nominate for these different awards? And I will think of people that I kn knew who did well in my classes. And, and that wasn't just the person who did well on the test, that was the person whose name I knew because they came to office hours and they did well on the test. And so that, uh, so then your name will just naturally pop to my mind and I'll nominate you for an award. And then, uh, then you can do the same for them in the future, right? Uh, when you can pay it back. And that will, having uh, more of these relationships will make your life, there's good sociology on having a good support community in your profession helps you be happier in your life and your work and it'll be more fun and meaningful. So thank you for your attention. Great, super. Thank you so much, Catherine. It, it is really more fun to do research and be part of this if, if you have a village to do it with. It, that's what makes it fun. Uh, right. I, I firmly believe <laughs> So we are going to wrap this up. So 
We're going to take the questions as an online chat. So you'll, in a few minutes, you'll be able to go online and please send in questions and we'll all be online to um, answer them. But before we do that, let me just tell you that we have a feedback survey because we're trying to continue making this better as we go forward with the webinar. So you will receive this link. You can either go ahead and use this QR code or type in this link, or I think you will also get an email with the link. And we would really appreciate your feedback. Uh, if you have specific speakers to suggest or specific research areas, that's part of the survey, so that we know what research areas you'd like to hear more about, and, and same with the uh, mentoring topics. Uh, this is a CRAW virtual town hall meeting, and so uh, there are lots of other resources and programs that CRAW has has that they offer. And if you have not participated in another CRAW uh, program, uh, we really encourage you to go to the website and see there are programs for undergraduates, for graduate students, for faculty, um, all levels of the career. So please go ahead and um, look up the CRAW resources. The survey link has been sent to you in the chat. So you can just click on that link and follow the feedback survey. And we're going to go ahead now and go into the online chat. So it is a chat to all participants. Uh, it's not the Q&A. So thank you again for attending. And thank you, Catherine, for the great research talk and uh, mentoring on building your village.